Greetings and salutations. I've been Asian Sports Talk up and rolling on a Wednesday. He's Vince D'Addario. I'm Sean Styers. Hope you're having a good one today. Vince and I congregated along with Brian and a few others this morning over at the Irish Athletic Center. So we got to watch a little bit of practice this morning and I got to talk to some players and some of the coaches ah. after the, the practice as well. I'm uh I've saved up some of that for tomorrow. I think I've got okay. some, uh, some things that'll be of interest on tomorrow's shows. We go in depth with some of those post practice comments and stuff like that. Salty's nice. favorite, the great one, was one of Oof. them. So, well, yeah. he, he deserves uh, all of his flowers at the moment. We'll see if it translates to next season, but he does. So far, so good, man. He, he is looking good in a lot of ways. He is. He's looking very good. Ryan Roberts, hello to you as well, sir. Glad to have you here as always. Let's just get started because um got a lot of questions start up in the queue tonight. Speaking okay. Of Salty and the great one. Let's just lead it off with that. Salty says the great <clears throat> one continues to set the pace at wide receiver, number one in rep order, and is showing increased long speed. What's been his greatest improvement? Detail at length. He says. Wow. That is uh that's a very specific question. Um, I would say. For me, his greatest improvement has just been just doing it. You know what I mean? <laughs> he, he doesn't look lost. He looks he looks like a veteran. He looks like somebody who belongs at the front of the line. You know what I mean? And and he was always a good route runner. He was always good, you know, at doing all of the things you need to do as a wide receiver. And then he got hurt. And so everything kind of took a step back. And so I think he's back to his, you know, he's obviously not fighting a hamstring right now and I just think he plays with a confidence level that he hasn't had in a little bit you know in a while uh since midseason of last year and so he's he's playing that way um that's that's the biggest thing I can see because he he's always been good I mean we we knew that he was arguably their best receiver there for a while and then he got injured and he was kind of a shell of himself and so I just think it's a confidence level thing yeah, I think all those things, and you look at the fact this is his second spring now, and he was an early enrollee last right. year. And there were moments where he shined last spring, but I think he has been I think he's been a standout in terms of the receivers this spring. And like nailing down, you know, one biggest improvement, I think is tough. And you kind of went through all those different things, and, and it's kind of an accumulative an, an accume effect because yeah, for he sure. went through a freshman season. He did get injured and that obviously came up today, but he definitely looks healthy now. And when you look at like the physique that Jaden Greathouse has now in his sophomore spring season, as, a, sure. as opposed to his freshman, he looks different there. And like he was asked today about speed and quickness. If he feels faster and, and quicker and he's like well I feel like I was always fast and quick and it's like but yeah but do you feel faster <laughs> right. and quicker now because he sure looks like it and especially when you compare him to most of the rest of that bunch out there again I just think he really stands out and that's the thing he is he is standing out so far and it's and it's all added up and I think you know again just being a sophomore second go round. And it and it feels like just listening to some of his comments today, and again, we'll we'll let you hear some of them tomorrow. But it feels like this switch at position coach has played a part of that as well, just in terms of confidence, cohesiveness for not just him, but for the entire group. As oh well. yeah, yeah, no doubt about that. That was uh, it. It's just a different. It's a completely different group from coach down. I mean, and and I obvious that's an obvious statement since it's different people. Uh, but just the way they go about their business, just the way that they operate, it's it's a completely different looking group. And it's also a group they're going to count on in a very different way, I think, moving forward. Uh, and that's going to be a very interesting thing to watch as well right. with Mike Dembrock calling the shots. Matt is questioning my Kansas Jayhawks t-shirt attire i don't know if you knew this matt but i am a kansas alum so all there the are a few there are a few jayhawk t-shirts in my in my closet in my drawer 
So they come out from time to time. Yeah. <laughs> yep. That, this is true. I, I have nothing from the school that I ended up getting my degree from. Not Where did you end up getting your degree article. from? Was IU. Was it I, now? IU SB. Okay. <laughs> I, I, my diploma is hanging on the wall over there. It doesn't say anything about South Bend. There's nothing South Bend written on it. It says Indiana University right at the top. So It's all that matters. It's all that matters. But That's I will not you know. own any IU stuff ever. Right. So. Now, kind of on the same, you know, same but different topic, we were talking about Jaden Greathouse. Tyler wants to know the difference between Mike Brown's coaching and Stucky's coaching from last year. Oh, I would say from a, a, a drill perspective, you know, the drills that they do are actually applicable towards what they are going to do on the field. Uh, you know, it, it's always good when you can see an application from drill to field and, and the, and for the players as well, that they can actually draw from the drills for what they're going to do on the football field. I see that a lot more. I see a lot of more, a lot more individualized coaching as well, uh, which is, which is very good. Um, and, and just the way that he coaches, I like better, you know, so that would be the noticeable differences I would say. Yeah. And I mean, it's, it's hard to really tell just because of it's been so cold. Every time we've been over there, they've been inside the Irish Athletic Center. And for the most part, that means that, you know, we stand you know, stand or sit up on the balcony. So we're kind of away yep. from them when they go outside. And we typically the receivers are in a place where we can literally stand about 10 yards from them, you know, so we can see and hear a lot of the coaching points and stuff like that. Yeah going on so really aside from what Vince just said those are really the only visible yeah things you know how that translates to the field that'll be the next step and maybe we get to start to see some of that in the blue gold game but we haven't actually you know again because we it we're just at a time where we haven't been sort of up got to be up close close to that position group you know it's like the receivers and the running backs are on the far side of the field you know the 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 multiple fields when they're outside and yep. we just haven't got to be close enough to kind of you know peek in and, and sort of hear right. some of the things that are going on over there you know beyond just those little visual kind of things it's like well and you know to an extent drills are drills but i will say the receivers just what we've seen so far do seem to be a little bit more you know kind of honed in looking i think than yeah what we, than what we saw last year agreed all right. There's an offensive line question. Sean Kelly. Oh boy. How good do you think Tosh Baker can be? Floor and ceiling. Well, it kind of remains to be seen, to be honest with you. I think he can be just fine at right tackle for Notre Dame. I think he can be a part of a very good offensive line. Uh, that would be his ceiling. His floor would be he's going to get beat out <laughs> like that. We, we just he's been around forever it feels like and now he's getting his opportunity and so I feel like right now there is not a ton of depth at tackle for Notre Dame and so he's got every opportunity every chance to be the right starting right tackle yeah and he look it's this is still Notre Dame right he's still a good tackle you know like the the floor is you're a starting tackle at Notre Dame. Like that's a pretty good floor, right? His ceiling isn't like Joe Alt, you know what I mean? Uh, but he can be a very serviceable right tackle at Notre Dame that you don't have to overly worry about. How about that? Yeah, and I think we're gonna get the real. We're not gonna get the answer to this question in the spring. We're we're gonna get more, closer to the answer of this question. Maybe early in fall camp, because I'm curious to see, mm -hmm. can Emil Wagner eat a few more milkshakes and pizzas and, and French fries and maybe a few pork tenderloins this summer and come in tipping the scales at around 300 pounds and be able to be, you know, a much yeah. more physical kind of guy and, and pose a true <clears throat> challenge to Tosh Baker for that spot. Because just like last year, the guys coming out of the spring, as we found out quickly, Almost as soon as fall camp, not not as soon as fall camp started, but what a week or two into fall camp, everything changed pretty quickly. Yeah, and so that's going to be 
that's going to be where we find the true answer is what Emil Wagner is able to do this summer in terms of bulking up because I think he's he's got the skill and he's obviously got agility and he's he's getting stronger and stuff like that but he needs to be able to pack on those pounds to be a true right college tackle and I think that he can truly challenge for that spot if he's able to add some of that girth that he needs to add for sure yeah no 100% and uh I I like Emil Wagner uh, a lot actually mm-hmm. he just needs to figure out how to get bigger and stay bigger you know uh and that's going to be it's going to be tough for him uh which I mean at least it's been up to this point right and so unless he truly challenges Tosh Baker Tosh Baker is going to be your starting right tackle now this offensive line as a unit can be really good and Tosh Baker could be a part of that like you know that you know that's that's his ceiling to me being uh one of the five of a of a really solid offensive line concur Joe Allen wants to know if Notre Dame will get their offensive points average up to 42 and a half points over under 42 and a half this year. So Notre Dame just set the record for the highest scoring offense in their history. And now we want more. (laughs) That's what I'm seeing. I'm going to take the under because they did just set the record and nobody was impressed with their offense last year. (laughs) That's true. Which is crazy. Uh, But it would be, look, is it possible? Sure. You just want Notre Dame's offense to show up in the big games. Like, that's all, that's all I want. I don't care what the end game is. I really don't. I mean, they absolutely blew because look out what teams happened last year. Last year. Yeah, I mean, they blew out a bunch of teams that they should have blown out. And, I mean, that's why it's a scoring average. But the numbers were lower against the better teams on the schedule. Right, right. right. I mean, and... All that, all that matters is you've got an offense that can compete against a ranked team, a legit ranked team. Sure. They had the games that they lost, right? Was it three total? And one close win. The rest were blowouts. Man, that's a pretty good offensive showing. And I I will just say I will take the under this time around. Notre Dame's had easy schedules in the past, too, and they set the record last year. So I'm just not looking for them to set the record two years in a row. Maybe they do, but... Well, we'll see. New offensive coordinator, they who led the nation in scoring True. last season. I think they'll be I think they'll average right around 40 points. I'll take slightly under, but I'll also take yeah. 40 points a game. Oh yeah, for sure. I think that's the goal. 40 is the goal, I would say. 42 and a half is a big number. Yeah. What changes, if any, have you seen in practice now that Mike Mickens is coaching the entire secondary and Marty Biaggi is assisting? Any improvements? We haven't seen enough practice to really be able to go very deep into that, if I'm being honest. Mm -hmm. Today, when I'm watching the defense, the safeties were working with Al Golden specifically on that recognition drill. It was the safeties and the linebackers were working together and they were doing formation recognition and some motion recognition and stuff like that. So they were working as a group while Mike Mickens was working with the corners and doing some zone turns and some different things of that nature and some one-on-one type situations with just defensive guys uh, or just cornerbacks. So I believe Marty Biaggi was over there and obviously Max Bola was over there, but Al Golden was running that that whole thing like Mm that nobody else was really allowed to say much uh and so it didn't it wouldn't have mattered who the safeties coach was during that drill you know what i mean and mike mickens was working with the corners at that time well and that's seen enough there are no visible changes because just like last year you still have two guys for the two position groups it's not like mike mickens is running around out there you know like a chicken with his head cut off trying to you know, talk details with both the cornerbacks and the safeties. Last year, you had Chris O'Leary with the safeties. Now you've got Marty Biagi back there. Yeah, and right. You've still got Mike Mickens focusing on the corners. I think the biggest difference is the stuff that we can't see. And Mickens talked a little bit about this after practice today. And again, we'll have some of this on tomorrow's show. But it's more for him about now they can all be in the same meeting room and they can yeah. talk about concepts as a whole 
So that's nothing, you know, but good for them. And, but they can also still break up into groups if they need to, because right. yeah. you've got a full-time guy who's the coach. And I know that this keeps coming up and Brian, you know, it was on the boards, the champions lounge today. Like people keep wanting this GA for some reason to coach with the safeties, <laughs> you know, like Marty Biaggi has actual division one experience <laughs> Right. Coaching the secondary. Why do you want a graduate assistance with little to no experience back Seriously. there with those guys? It makes no sense. The guy's a good coach. You know? Right. Exactly. <laughs> I yeah. don't get it. 100%. <laughs> By the way, you're starring, right? Uh, I can be. Okay. Yeah. You start. Because I started <laughs> off starring. No, it's I all think. good. I like, got you. I've been reading along so I can go back. I just wanted to make sure we were on the same page because I've been kind of sitting here on the uh, back end of the comments. I got here. you little Got bit you. you all right good deal Andre wants to know how the freshman receivers are looking what do you think about Cam Williams and Micah Gilbert so far M Micah Gilbert is an unexpected surprise mm -hmm. in a good way I mean that he looks like a third year college guy uh he does not look like he should be you know getting his tux ready for prom you know <laughs> what I mean like he, he just he looks physically like he belongs he runs his routes like he belongs that he looks like he's ready to contribute. Now he doesn't need to contribute. That's the glory of all of this is he doesn't need to contribute, but he could, you know what I mean? And so he's in the mix and then you've got Cam Williams and, and Cam has the raw tools. You know what I mean? And we saw some of that today with some of these long balls and things like that, but you know, he's still kind of, fighting the routes a little bit and do, you know, he, he just, he's a little bit more raw. And so it's going to take a little bit more time, but I think he's already looking more comfortable than he did when we saw him on day one uh, of the spring. And yeah. so he's going to be great, but they don't need their freshmen to be great this season. That's right. It was a so, lot different last year where they really right. had to kind of try to accelerate things and everything else because of what they had with the roster. And, and I just got done uh, putting up, writing some stuff up, you know, based on talking to Mike Brown and, and uh, you know, after practice today, it's, it's interesting. They're going to have 11 scholarship wide receivers by the time is all it's all, you know, but by the time yeah. all camp rolls around, because you're going to obviously add Logan Saldata this summer and Bo Collins, who is here, but still finishing his coursework with Clemson can't practice with the team yet. And Mike Brown made that abundantly clear when he was asked a few questions about Bo Collins, you know, at the end of the thing today. It's like, yeah, I, I can't watch him do anything, basically. I know he's around, but I can't yeah. do anything. I've heard he's here, but I don't know. Yeah. Because <laughs> yeah, he's still but, technically a recruit. Like, he, you know, you have to. Right. There's rules, man. There's rules. Right. The so I agree with it. what you said. But at the same, you know, there's a reason they brought in guys like Bo Collins and Chris Mitchell. They brought right. in veteran guys with speed, specific kind of guys, veterans with speed experience. You can throw obviously Harrison in that mix as well, but they, they're not going to have to lean on these freshmen nearly as much. And the guy that we led this thing off talking about, Jaden Greathouse, has looked as good as anybody out there. And again, a year two guy who has a chance to really emerge this year as a full fledged, you know, leader of that pack. I think right. so they're looking good, but you don't need to rush them at this point. And that's, that's nothing but good news. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. And that, like they said, that's the luxury, right? You can, you can use Micah Gilbert as a pleasant surprise and work him around and do all of those different things. And you can kind of wait for Cam to kind of catch up a little bit and you don't have to force feed, which is, it's a great place to be. It's a great position to be in. Yes. Interesting question from Mark. Do you want to address this now, Vince? Do you want to save it for rapid fire when we talk a little bit? We were going to talk about Riley Leonard in rapid well, fire. What do you I, what do you think? I can address the concern about the injury prone label okay. part. So Mark is asking, did Riley Leonard come back? Riley Leonard was at practice today wearing an ankle brace on that uh right ankle, big kind of blocky looking ankle brace brace, but he was he was out there throwing the football. Um, Mark wants to know if, if, um, we think he did it partly due to concern over the label of being injury prone. What do you think about that? 
I don't think that had squat to do with it. Uh, these guys don't necessarily care, and the strength coach and the trainers and the coaches don't care what the media is saying, and they don't care what the you know <clears throat> all the chirping is. That that just doesn't that doesn't land. You know what I mean? And so yeah. I don't think that had anything to do with it whatsoever. Um, as far as quarterbacks, other quarterbacks getting an opportunity, I don't. He's not worried about getting passed up either. So neither one of those things. Yeah, I missed I'm that sure. last part. I, I, not, not, neither one of those things had anything to do with him coming back. And we'll we'll address him coming back and what that looked like and all of that during rapid fire. But those two reasons, Mark, uh, I don't think had anything to do with him getting back on the field whatsoever. He's not worried about it getting passed up. I promise you that. That's for sure. Concur. Sean wants to know, do you think Junior Tui Alamaka is a bust on the defensive line? I don't like the word bust. I think he has been underwhelming uh, this spring thus far. Now, again, we have And that's disappointing ton, because this is a step-up opportunity. For absolutely. 100%. 100% because the Viper position it's is, is open it's for open for taking. business. Yeah, yes. for sure. <laughs> so it has been disappointing, but I'm not ready to label him a bust yet. I mean, that... You got to go a couple years of being nothing for that to be the case. No, exactly. I mean, how many how many spring stars have we seen who didn't amount to anything, and then just guys who kind of muddled their way sometimes through the spring who ended up having pretty good to great careers. You would like to see more from a guy who is getting more opportunities because of where the depth chart is right now. But I think bust is a little bit too soon on that right. because he's still relatively relatively new to the position still as well yeah yeah no absolutely completely agree with that too Jaden Greathouse was the number one punt returner and performed with excellence okay salty a little there bit we much go there. there we go do you think Notre Dame's number one receiver should also be the number one punt returner as he was in high school I sure. Yeah. I mean, if they, he's the best one, he gives you the best opportunity. Yeah. You give him a shot at it. If you have a guy who is right on the verge of, it, it all depends on the, where you have them ranked as punt returners, right? If one guy is slightly ahead of another guy, but that guy is getting a ton of wide receiver reps, and the other guy isn't, then I'm putting the guy who isn't back at punt return, right? Because he's going to be more fresh at the end of a game. And so that's the guy I would want in there. So it all just depends on how everything shakes out. Now, if Great House is head and shoulders above everybody else from a punt return standpoint, then you put him back there. I don't know that that's going to be the case at the end of the day. I think they've got a lot of really good options back there to return kicks. And even though Jaden Great House is looking really good at it at the moment, I think his ceiling is much higher as a wide receiver than it is as a punt returner. I would agree with that. But if you change the name uh, in this question to Rocket Ismail, you wouldn't be asking the question. <laughs> well, right? I I love Jaden Greathouse, but he's not Rocket. No, not Rocket. he's not. But what I'm saying is, <laughs> right. it doesn't matter if if the guy yeah. if if the guy is is a guy you think can be a game changer. Right. You put him back there, and that's regardless the of where part. he is yeah. on the depth chart. Yes, of any other position. Now, obviously, if you get into the middle of the season. And maybe he's a little bit banged up and and whatnot, and you want to keep him out there on, you know, just just playing wide receiver, and you put somebody else back there, and then maybe like in the fourth quarter, you know, if it's like a, you know, like you're down by a touchdown or something like that, you know, maybe you slip him back there after you've had somebody else return the last five or six punts. You know what I'm saying? Like right, right. Like, you know, it 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 doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if he's the number one wide receiver, the number eight wide receiver. You know, whoever, if he's the best guy for the job and, and he can be a game-changing type guy, you put him back there. So I'm not concerned about it at all. Right. Yep. It's a legit question, though. It's a great question. They like the question. Yeah, it's a great question. So Josh wants to know, so who's the starter at field receiver? So I don't know that it's going to be a static – you're starting here, you're starting here, you're starting here kind of a situation at wide receiver, uh, if that makes sense, Sean. I think they're going to move guys around. I think Denbrock wants to move guys around. Uh, mm -hmm. I've I, Honestly, 
Look, and Greathouse has been moving around. Even though he's mostly in the slot, he's right. moving around still too. Yep. I mean, you, here here's your room, right? You've got Deion Colsey, who I think has looked great this spring thus far. Mm -hmm. Okay. And obviously this is going to be a big opportunity for him this coming season, right? This is kind of a make or break season for Deion Colsey. So Colsey's looked good. Jaden Harrison has looked good at the slot, right? Faison, we know what he brings to the table. Uh, I thought Chris Mitchell has looked good so far. KK Smith has looked good. You know, Micah Gilbert as a freshman has looked good. Great house has looked good. So, you know, you've got all kinds of options. And then Jaden Thomas, he looked he was a little banged up today. Hopefully he can be healthy for an entire season. So there are plenty of people that you can move around. You can put Great House out there. You can put Chris Mitchell out there. You could put Bo Collins out there. I mean, there you could do a lot of different things, move a lot of guys around if you find a matchup that you like and then make it work that way. I don't know that it's going to be quite so static as people want to make it. You know what I mean? From like, you're an X, you're a Z, you're a Y. Or yeah, whatever. I mean, I, I think I think probably the most static thing is probably Faison. Like, he's just where he's, he's a you slot. Know, makes, and Jane Harrison yeah. is a slot. I mean, well, see, and that's Smith. the thing. It's like, just like, just like, uh, fortunately, you do have more guys who can play outside than what you had last year. And that right. was another thing that really bound up last year's receiver core but the fact that you do have more flexibility there's only so many guys who can play the slot unless you're going to play four wides you know exactly like, <laughs> exactly on each side yep <laughs> you know so you've got to be able to you want to have your most talented guys on the field so the way to right. do that is you've got to be moving them around in the spring is the time to do that oh and yeah i just think i think that like really all these jobs are up for grabs. I think it's a lot more just experimental right now with a lot of things and what they're yep. doing. And like I said, it's going to be very matchup driven. I mean, Mike Denbrock is clearly a matchup guy. And so if he sees a matchup that he likes and he thinks he can burn somebody with speed on the outside, he's going to put phase on or somebody mm -hmm. out there that is just going to blow right by a guy or, you know, whatever Jane Harrison or, you know, <clears throat> however he feels like he can attack that weakness in the defense, he's going to do it. And I don't think he's going to be married to, well, we can't put him out there. He's a slot receiver. Or I can't put Jaden Thomas, for example, in the slot, which he has played before because he's a big body. You know what I mean? You look yeah. for those those matchups that you can win, and then you go do it. And as uh, Joe Allen says, it sounds like a problem, a good problem. And you're absolutely right. I think they're going to be very deep. And they're going to have a lot of options at wide receiver. And then, of course, you've got like Jeremiah Love, who's been – getting reps at slot as well so and that's options like jesse and i talked about that at the end of last week with it when that whole jeremiah love thing came about sort of mid about this time last week i guess but you know like the idea of of putting like like jeremiah love and jordan Faison right next to each other and then all of a sudden you put these you know you put the safeties in a bind you put a linebacker in a bind and everyone's trying to figure out, you know, who, who's going with who, you know, what it, you make them make decisions at the line of scrimmage. I think that that is a very, uh, very enticing sort of idea to be able to, the things that you can do with a guy with, with the skill set and the speed that Jeremiah love has when you throw him. Oh my gosh. <laughs> it's endless, right? I mean, you know, just motioning or whatever you want to do with him and make him end up in the slot and, you know, him against a linebacker or a safety. Yes, please. You know, yep. come on. Yep. On that subject, Jadarian Price has been uh, taking reps during some wide receiver uh -huh. receiver uh -huh. drills and performing well. From what you've seen, how much time will he see at wide receiver during games? I think it's zero. He's not going to he's not going to see time at wide receiver. He's going to see time at running back that motions to wide receiver or something along those lines. Like I, I don't, I don't see him just, you know, breaking the huddle or whatever and coming out and playing wide receiver. Like I, th right. they're, they're rotating those guys in with the wide receivers to get time catching the football and learning how to catch the football, how to run some routes, you know, those kinds of things with somebody that is focused on watching well, those things. And so that they're actually learning the route tree and mm -hmm. they're actually, you know, learning, the offense as a wide receiver so that they can put them out there in certain situations. So it's not just like, okay, Jadarian, now you're going to, you know, line up in the slide or you're going to line up outside, you know, you're going to run a skinny post or, you know, that you know, this is what you're going to do 90% of the time when you line up out there. He's actually a viable option to go out there 
and do something. And just like with Jeremiah Love, I think, let's say Price is on the field already. Like he just ran the ball on, you know, first and 10. Okay. Right. So now he's already on the field and here comes Jeremiah Love on the field. So now you're the opposing defensive coordinator up in the press box and you got 12 and 24 on the field together. If you know that either one of them, you know, can go line up as a wide receiver, either one of them can stay in the backfield. Again, you're putting the defense in a bind, not knowing exactly where they're going to go, what they're going to do. And the fact that they can actually go out there and be viable receiver options. And they've all got the hands for it. So Right. Why not take advantage of that skill set? And again, spring is the time yep. to really start to drill down on some of that stuff. When when you're not preparing for games, you're just preparing to get these guys ready and give them the base of knowledge so that they can slip into that if you want them to. Right, at 100%. And so the more tools you can put in their toolbox, basically, the better off they're going to be. And so that's what you're doing in the spring is you're equipping them with all these different tools and all these different ways to be effective. Uh, and so I, the, the possibilities are endless is what they are. I can only, I can just imagine. I just, I, I see Mike Denbrock sitting in his office, you know, and you see like the bubble above his head. And it's like a beautiful mind of like different <laughs> things that he can do. And look, he, he's, he's not like a Steve Sarkeesian, like offensive guru. Like that's not who Mike Denbrock is. He'll just do simple stuff to mess with you. Like that's, right. that's just what he's going to do. It's not going to be exotic and crazy and all this other stuff it's gonna be super simple you know but he's gonna find those matchups and he's gonna exploit them and he doesn't care how he does it and so that's why these running backs are getting time at wide receiver and practice in the spring just gives you more opportunities for matchups that you mm-hmm. can win mm-hmm. dj wants to know scale of one to ten how concerned are we about the pass rush from the viper and big end <sighs> I, six i guess uh until I see something, and that's the problem. We haven't seen any line play this spring. Right. Like see today nothing. they actually had pads on, but they went outside. Of course. Well, like, yeah, the lines the lines went outside on different right. ends of the field. And then of course, when period five, the last period that we got to see was over, they came on and it looked like they were getting ready to do some scrimmaging, you know. Right. So <laughs> they did. We saw one play kind of out of the corner of my eye as we were like walking out. Cheater. I know, I know. I I, I could tell I was, I was getting like the look from the back of my head, <laughs> but uh, it got blown up anyway, so it didn't matter. But we just haven't, I haven't seen enough to be worried or not worried, if I'm being honest. I, I haven't seen RJ Oban, you know, get after the quarterback. I haven't seen any of these things to be overly worried or overly not worried. You know what I mean? And so I feel very confident about the interior getting after the quarterback. But they're going to need pressure from the outside. And as Sean alluded to earlier, the Viper position is wide open, man. Like there, there's right. like a blinking neon sign that says vacancy over that spot. You know what I mean? And who's going to take it? Who's going to get after it? I, I don't know. I'm less worried about RJ Oban's side than I am with that Viper side. I would oh, say me that. Me too. Yeah, for sure. It's really the Viper side is not that much different than last year. But all that said... Because you do have Howard Cross and Riley Mills in the middle, it, like you've got a an NFL body and an F, probably you know could have been an NFL ready three technique defensive tackle with Mills this year, but he's back, which is great news for the. But the fact that you've got those two guys on the inside, there's also just so there's disruption there, and it also like you. You can't double the outside all the time when you've got those two guys in the middle. So that is going to give those guys some one-on-one type opportunities, and it's just going to be up for them to win. And I I think that R.J. Oban is going to win more than he loses. I think Jordan Botello, obviously, we all know that he's got the athletic ability to win more than than he loses, but we do need to see it. So what's my concern level? I'd put it a little bit lower than yours. I'd put it at a four. Because I really don't think it's that much different than than what it was last year, and everything worked out okay last year. Yeah, so that's fair. Yeah, because you're basically fair. set. You're basically replacing Javante John Baptiste with R.J. Oban. You know, and so I'm 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 pretty confident that that Oban can at least perform 
at that level. And then really right. it's just up to the other side to see what they can get out of that, you know, but there Absolutely. are other ways as we saw to get pressure on the quarterback. That's not exclusive to the Viper defensive end and stuff like that. Right. Salty. I don't know if he's just trying to stir things up here or what, but he says there's some buzz around Andrick Estime being drafted by the Chiefs. Which team do you think would be the best fit? And uh, which team do you like him to join? Look, everybody who has a an NFL team that they follow would love for Audric Estime to join that's their right. team. Okay? So <clears throat> that's the answer to the last part. Sean says Dallas. Vince says the Bears. <laughs> that's right. That's the answer to the last part. Look, we talked about this at the right. end of yesterday's show. Okay. Like, like my Dallas Cow, because I was wearing, for the first time, since the January debacle mm. in the playoffs, I wore, not just on this show, but for the first time <laughs> since then, yeah, I wore anything with Cowboys on it. That's how ticked off I, get it. I had been. And, you know, I was looking for a long sleeve shirt because it was a little cool yesterday. And like, I'm like, well, I can only wear the unsalted shirt so many times because I keep wearing the unsalted and salty <laughs> takes it an insult every time I do. So <laughs> it's like, I'll just go with the with the with the cowboys veterans look thing but as jesse told everybody yesterday the only thing that's going to make me happy about this offseason is if audric estime gets drafted by dallas so i mean i'm just setting is. myself up for many more months of of not being happy with anything they do but that is literally the only thing that can turn my offseason on those pathetic guys down there in Dallas so I get it and but what, I mean best fit anyone 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 that wants to run the football yeah. anybody that has you know any kind of inclination to run the football that's that's where he would be the best fit and I would think that any NFL team could make Audric Estime work in their offense Sloppy Joe sleepers on defense my number one sleeper on defense right now is a Don Schuler. that he has been chiseled out of a mountaintop, man. Like he fits the mold physically. I like what he's starting to do athletically as well. I mean, he's not hesitating. He's taking advantage of the fact that Rod Hurd is not in an Notre Dame uniform right now. And he's getting all the number one reps next to an all American in Xavier Watts. And so I think that he's taking full advantage. I think it's only going to pay off in a positive way for Notre Dame. And so Adon Schuler is my answer to that question. Yes. Everyone's got their answer. Basically, if you're a fan of whatever team you want, Audrey Gessner. Yeah, I look at all of course the you do. On this. Yes. yes, 100%. I will go a little bit different route. A guy who kind of stood out for me today, um, KVA. Okay. Linebacker. Like what we saw from him. And... I don't know. Like the question that Salty asks was, you know, he said during the motion period, Drake Bowen was at Mike Kingston was next and uh, he knocked some people back in one on ones. That's what caught my eye was was, uh, you know, him, the, the, the physicality, especially as a true freshman early enrollee he was playing with. But he asked, can he start at Mike linebacker? I, you know, it might be a little bit early. On that, the signs of physicality are obviously what you want to see yeah. from any middle linebacker. But you know, like I, I, I would think that the next option right now is probably you know, like if it's not Drake Bowen, you just slide Kaiser over there, and you've got other options at uh, at Will and at and at Rover and that kind of thing. But I like I like what we're starting to see, just some sure. of the uh, the inklings from uh, from Kingston. Yeah, no, absolutely. And look, he's he's a great linebacker. They're going to try to find a way to get him reps. There's yeah. no doubt about He'll it. He'll be out there on the field just like Bowen was yeah. last year, playing a lot of special right. teams and get him out there some 100%. snaps when the opportunities present the present it, themselves. If, if you're putting KVA at Mike, that means you're benching Bowen, which I don't think any of us want to do either. You know what I right. mean? And so you got to remember that there, it's not like you're adding a 12th player to the defense. And so, <laughs> you know, I'm not I'm not quite ready to to bench Drake Bowen yet. That's that's what I'll say. Yes. Thank you for the super chat, Alan Watson. That just came in. He says, How does this up this ACC upheaval affect Notre Dame in the upcoming years? 
Is there something new that has come out that I'm unaware of, Mr. Styers? Nothing has upheaved yet. You've got a couple okay. of schools suing the ACC, but they're well, suing the ACC that, yeah. because they can't find a way out. I'm assuming that's what he's talking about. Okay. It's just the fact that Clemson and Florida State are ticked off. And it's like, okay. you can go to your room screaming and crying because you're not getting any dessert and you can be ticked off all you want. Still doesn't mean you're getting dessert. <laughs> and I don't think, you know, Clemson and ACC can kick and scream and, and yep. go to court all they want. But as I've said it before, if they had a true way out of the ACC, they would already be out of the ACC. And I don't think ESPN wants to see the ACC break up because remember, they've got a TV contract. That's TV inventory for yeah. them. Like they want to see it keep, you know, stay together. I think, I think the kingpin, Greg Sankey, wants to see it stay together for that matter. I completely agree with you on that one. I look, it, let, let's pretend that the ACC just it implodes on itself and there is no more ACC. How does that affect Notre Dame? That means they got to find a new home for their Olympic sports. Right. And I can tell you right now, the Big East would be sitting there with open arms, ready to take Notre Dame back with no problem whatsoever. And Notre Dame would be just fine. They could stay independent as a football team. They have a home for all of their Olympic sports. And you just keep on moving on. Uh, I think you could say the same thing about the um, the American Conference. They'd take Notre Dame in a heartbeat, too, with all their Olympic sure. sports. You know what I mean? Like, would that be a step down for some of the sports? Sure, it would be. But they would still have a home, and they would still have schedules. And that's what matters at the end of the day. And so I don't know that it, it, it's not going to push Notre Dame into a conference like people think it's going to. I really don't think that. And I also don't think that the ACC is going to implode in the next year or two either. So... I think this is all just uh, everybody's worried about something happening when I don't think that it's going to happen. There's still and, 12 more years on that contract. Right. I think that I think that you have to get probably at least past another six years when because the the reason the buyout is so big is because it's like you would owe what you are due for, for every year way. that's remaining yeah. on the contract plus right. some other money so i think maybe as that shrinks and it potentially becomes a little bit more viable but they still have to find homes as well i think everyone you know just assumes and, and i i realize why you would assume it that the big 10 or the sec are so greedy that they would just you know want florida state and clemson but again i don't think that those are nearly those they're not as valuable those schools and those brands as they think they are yeah you know, right, right. like and especially with, you know, Clemson's at a point with its football program where is it is it going to stay an elite program? It's come back to the pack, obviously, in the last couple of years. Is it going to stay with the pack or are they going to stay with the elite? I mean, that's really the only thing that makes that gives Clemson any value, because as a TV property, there's just not that much demand for Clemson because they're from a right. really small exactly. market in the middle of South Carolina. Well, and here's the thing, Florida state is not a huge draw from a TV market standpoint either. Right. So there's no guarantee that like maybe the big 12 would take them in or I, you know, I don't well, know that it's and a guarantee. from the SEC standpoint, they've already got Florida. So they're right. Florida is right. in all the markets they would want, uh, the, right. you know, Florida State just doesn't give them that much more value than what they're already getting with Florida. Brian made a good point yesterday when we kind of brought this up on the show that we did in the afternoon. And, and he said that there's a clause or something along the lines of that in the ESPN contract that if they need to stay at 14 teams and if it dips below that, then ESPN can pull out of the contract. Well, they just went and got three more teams, right? You know, as a cushion, essentially. True. So they, they're actually being fairly smart about this whole thing. And let's say those two teams get out. Well, they just brought in three. And so now they've got a cushion. They're at 17 now instead of 14. And so they're, you know, the, I would say the ACC is actually being proactive. And that, that's what I was thing. getting ready to say. They were what the Pac-12 and some of these, yeah. you know, the Big 12. It took the Big 12 a while to be proactive, but they were definitely more proactive than the Pac-12. 
Oh, was. Pac-12 just, as as Brian said yesterday, I don't want to steal his thunder, but they just had their fingers in their ears and were just like, you know, as everything was collapsing around them and just hoping for the best. You know what I mean? They well, didn't apparently, do anything. apparently, uh, Klevkov was taking the input of, you know, like a couple of university presidents or something like that who are connected to professors who are telling them, you know, this is what you need from the deal up here, you know, like the, the money, the, you know, the monetary gotcha. thing, like this is what you need up here when the reality was much, you know, much more down here and they could have kind of taken it in the middle, but they turned that down because they kept thinking they were going to get this pie in the sky deal. He was listening to the wrong people. Yeah, clearly. All along. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. All right. But I mean, it's always a relevant question because it, it's always circulating. Sure. It seems like. Oh, yeah. Tommy Guns wants to know, Vince, aside from blessing Brian with your presence at away games for Notre Dame, have you ever left? Is he like left South Bend? Is that? Yeah, I think I think that's what he's trying to say. Yeah. Have I ever left South Bend? I am not a very widely traveled person. I will definitely say that. I've taken a few trips here and there, but I've probably been west of the Mississippi like three times in my 43 years on this earth. Uh, not me. I went to Vegas when I was 21 with my dad. I went to the Fiesta Bowl and I went to a wedding in, uh, uh, where was that? In New Mexico. Okay. I think that's it. I think that's the only time I've ever really been west. west. You know what I mean? Like I, 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 I had a layover in Dallas uh, in January, but I wouldn't exactly call right. that like a visit. You know what I, I mean? We were, the the we were in the airport. <laughs> You know, but I, I'm not a very well tra like my parents, we didn't grow up super wealthy and like we didn't travel and I'm a teacher with five kids. Like we don't travel that yeah. often. You know what we, I mean? You know, being from Kansas, we took vaca vacations in Colorado and Missouri. Like <laughs> right. we really stepped out and yes. that wasn't even that much. Correct. We, we, we took a couple of like road trips uh, to the East coast when I was a kid. You know, we would do like the multi-city thing like yeah. for a week and then drive home. You know, I will actually now I I there was one summer where and it, this was like early 70s. I was still pretty young, but, you know, my dad was just a few years out of the Marines. And so we took this like summer road trip to go see his Marine buddies, you know. And so like we went to Wisconsin, <laughs> you know, we went through Chicago. We actually saw the aquarium and, you know, like outside of Soldier Field and all that kind of stuff. I remember doing that. And then we went to Detroit, <laughs> you know. So it was, you know, it was a real yeah. big bang summer in the car. Yeah, <laughs> seeing, right. Seeing Wisconsin and, you know, again, it's like young. So the, the, the coolest stuff was, was Chicago, just because I do, you know, vividly remember being, you know, like outside Soldier Field and stuff like that. And then we actually, I think, swung back through Kokomo on the way home because uh, my mom's sister and her husband used ah. to live in, in Kokomo. So, okay. Yeah. There you go. So that was, that was like the big adventure summer. Yeah. Other than that, we didn't venture too far yeah, out. Just not a very well-traveled human. You've traveled, obviously, with Notre Dame basketball. You've gotten a chance to yeah. and travel baseball. around a little bit. And but baseball. I mean, yeah got to go to paris you know not to not to brag but i mean that's a humble brag buddy put and that at the top of the that. list <laughs> yeah nothing wrong with that i mean no but i mean that has been pretty cool like when you sit back and like you get to like all the different places yeah that you know especially from a sports standpoint it's like you see sure. them on tv but it's another thing to be there and kind of get to see some Absolutely. of these places Oh, you one know. of my favorite trips was going to the Fiesta Bowl a couple of years ago, yeah. you know, with the football team. That was awesome. That was awesome. You know, and so I do get that kind of an opportunity, uh, but it's also at the, at the expense of my wife and kids. They're always like, come on, man. You know, so there is that part of it as well. Yeah, they're old enough to uh, shame you now. Oh, 100%. Like yes. when I was making most of those trips, my kids were still young, so they didn't have, you know, old much room. To shame you. But we actually, like, that was back in the days when – the teams still traveled commercial. So I would get to take advantage. Like I would get the air point, you know, like the mileage and stuff yeah. like that. And there was actually one time we were on a baseball trip and we were coming back through Pittsburgh and it was one of those overbooked, you know, flights from Pittsburgh to South Bend. And they were looking for people, you know, to get off, you know, like to stay off the flight. Yep. And they were offering some vouchers and stuff like that. And the, uh, the SID and I, 
<laughs> we were like, we were sitting over there, we're kind of huddled up and they're talking. They kept, they made the announcement a few times. And I was like, look, let's hold out and see if they offer <laughs> like more than what they're offering right now. Yeah, right. And sure enough, we held out for like 15 more minutes and they doubled it. So oh. they put us up in a hotel, you know, flew us home the next morning. But I think we each got like, a thousand fifteen hundred, you know, bucks worth of uh heck yeah, you know, mileage and took the family to Disney that summer using the free miles. See? So that was nice. What talking about. Yeah. It's well done. It's well played. All right, Vince. We've gone far enough. Are you ready for rapid fire? Ready for the Wednesday edition, baby. Let's go. Okay. I do have some uh questions of uh, uh, a few stragglers that I'm oh. saving up that I think will pair up with some of the stuff that we're going to talk nice. about in rapid fire tonight. Fill in the blank. Number one thing that stood out to you watching the first five periods of Notre Dame football practice this morning, excuse me, was blank. Ooh. Well, I mean, this is going to bleed into the next question, but the number one thing that stood out to me was the fact that Riley Leonard was anywhere near a football uh, and throwing it at a practice like that's the that's the number one thing that stood out to me uh outside of that i just really love the way marcus freeman sets that's up the next practice. topic so he's i know saving that, that. <laughs> that yeah, exactly, that's exactly right so i'm like yeah. uh but i i really like the way marcus freeman sets up his practices you know they go through stretch he brings them together fires them up a little bit and then they go into a hitting drill you know what i mean he is all about competition and just starting out practice on a high note and they're just banging each other and banging each other. And he's right there with the whistle, you know, controlling this entire um, drill that they're doing. I mean, he's part of it. And then, then they get off and then they start doing their individual stuff or they did special teams or whatever. But I just love the way he kind of starts things off and the way he puts practices together. That, that, that continues to stand out to me when I watch practice. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, again, it was a five-period practice, and we didn't get to see a whole lot in terms of competitive-type stuff. There was <coughs> some. So what I went with, because what you already mentioned is what we're going to talk about next, and we'll just right. you know get more into detail about Riley Leonard here in a minute. But another quarterback was there today. This is visit week, and there were a lot of recruits on hand today. And when I was walking up to the Irish Athletic Center, there were all these golf carts out there today and i'm like man what's with all the golf carts oh yeah that's right we just did a whole show about this ryan roberts and I yesterday about all the visits that are going on and brady hart was uh hanging out with chad bowden on the field for most of the time that we were there for what the 30 minutes or so that we were there the 2026 quarterback from florida was uh was out there today six foot four 180 pounds. He looked a little thicker than 180, I thought. But just the fact that he was out there hanging with Chad Bowden, you know, like they had their eyes on what the quarterbacks were doing and stuff like that, obviously, quite a bit. But this is a guy, like, as a sophomore, Vince, 14-1, and 41 touchdowns, <laughs> led his team to a state championship in Florida. Now, a smaller school, but still, in Florida. Yeah. His dad was a former major league baseball player. His dad, Alex, played both in college at the University of Florida, drafted by the Pirates. So this is a guy that Notre Dame's after. And Look, he was hanging out there with Chad Bowden most the of the last, time we were out there today. The last time I saw a quarterback hanging out exclusively with Chad Bowden was? Do you remember? Deuce. Deuce. Yep. And he was there exclusively Probably with Bowden last spring. and Gadouli. And it just feels... Felt very similar, at least from my vantage point. It felt very similar. They were talking to each other. They were kind of pointing some stuff out, and they were doing, you know, they they, they were uh, they were hitting him pretty hard. Yep, say that. So yes, he looked interested. Yeah, TD four and D wants to know if he looked interested. He did not look disinterested. He didn't look like a sophomore in high school either. I can tell no, you. No, he that. didn't. <laughs> no, he didn't. I mean, at six foot four, anyone's going to look older than a <laughs> sophomore in high school. To He's put together. Us. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he he was. He was put together, that's for sure. Like I said, the listed weight that I saw was 180. He looked, you know, he didn't look like he was 220 by any means, but he looked a little, he right. looked like he had, a, you know, a few milkshakes uh, above 180 anyway. Fill in the blank, Vince. Riley Leonard going through light practice while wearing an ankle brace at practice today is blank. Shocking. I it was not anticipating that in any way, shape, or form. And my initial reaction was, what the hell are they thinking? 
Um, I I tried to. Put it to, bluntly. <laughs> I mean, I'm just being honest. Like that was my first reaction. Like why? Why? What is the point? What are you gaining from having him out there and doing this kind of stuff? And look, at the end of the day, <clears throat> it was obviously all non-contact stuff. It was there was nobody around him anywhere near him as he was throwing the football which is obviously important. You don't want him taking team reps, even though he's got the red jersey on. You just never know if he's going to get stepped on or pushed or whatever. Like, you don't want that to happen. But I was trying to play devil's advocate with myself, and I was thinking, okay, most people's complaints about him being injured again in the spring is that he's going to lose timing with his receivers and all this other stuff. If he's able, which he appeared to be, because I think he had his best throwing day that we've seen in a long time, if he's able to be out there throwing on air to his receivers without any possibility of a setback, then okay, you can have him out there. I still, Vince D'Addario thinks that, that I would have him in a rocker on the sideline away from anything. It is his right foot, his plant foot. Correct. Um, it, it, it just looked to me like he really had to fight himself a couple of times. Like, like the other three quarterbacks would start jogging downfield and he wanted to, and then he kind of caught himself and had to yeah, stop he can't himself. Jog. Yeah, he, that's he, right. He, what happens if he trips over himself? Yeah. For, for what? A, th- a few passes? You know, like the, the whole timing right. thing? Again, you rest for two months and you've got the entire summer. The quarterbacks and receivers are together exactly. all the time in the summer if you want to work on timing. Like, this is not a worry spot. The spring, I, I I like you. Was completely shocked that he was out there, <laughs> and the fact that you know he was walking with the limp, which you would expect. But you know, again, you're in this situation because you had a lingering injury that you had surgery on, and now you've developed a stress fracture in your foot. You had to have a plate replaced in your foot, and just a couple weeks removed from that, you're out there with a brace on your ankle, throwing the football like they're just. There just seems to be no purpose to it for yeah, me. Like right. you said a couple of weeks ago when this injury first pa- popped up, put him in bubble wrap and <laughs> seriously, don't let him anywhere near the field in the spring. I, I I see no real reason that he needed to be out there doing anything. You know, again, it wasn't live, but just sure. the fact that he's out there and anything anything stupid can happen. I just right. I, yeah. I don't find any reason that he needs to be out there right now. Yep, completely agree. I just I think the cons outweigh the pros yes. on this one. I really do. I tried to wrap my mind around it and I tried to be, you know, positive about it, but like your season is hinging on this guy. Let's be honest. They can still be a 10 win team and uh, you know, eh, but I I just your your national championship hopes are resting right in that ankle. So I would not have him anywhere near action. Yeah. TD4ND, if he missed next year from injury, could he play college in 2025? He could. Yeah, he could. He'd be another year older. And at that point, going back to the question that came up during the mailbag portion of the show, he would have an injury-prone label at that yes. point. Yes, and he would also be If he misses this entire out. season. He would also transfer out of Notre Dame, too. I think I don't think they would so. wait around for him because hold back he, everybody else's development. Yeah, for a year exactly. They, they've got kind of a plan. You know what I mean? Who, whoever that plan is for 25, it would be fast forwarded to 24. And I just don't think that they would wait around for Riley Leonard. I just don't. I, again, this is just my first initial thinking of it. No, I think um, that makes sense because if he, if he were to miss the entire season, Someone else is starting those games. At least yep. one someone else, if not two someone else's. Exactly. So. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think at that point, you know, someone's going to prove themselves or disprove yeah. themselves. And then, yeah, I, I think the ship has probably sailed at that point. It's a good point. You probably and, don't. And Joe, Joe says he'll be as old as the walk-on kicker. He's a true <laughs> senior right now. Like, he's he's not old. He's like 21. So, or he's going to be a true senior. He's not even right. a, he's a true junior. He's still a true junior right now. Right. Yeah. So he's not he's three years removed, not even three full years removed from high school yet. So he's not an old man. It's not Sam Hartman with a sixth year of eligibility. Like that's not what we're talking about here. <laughs> right. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. <clears throat> so Vince, 
The Chicago Bears, of course, have the mm. both both the number one and number nine overall draft picks in the draft later this month. Most of the talk, of course, has been about what they're doing at number one, Caleb Williams, all that kind uh. of stuff. But their general manager, Ryan Poles, has come up with a plan to determine what they'll do with the number nine pick. He says his staff is going to break into teams, and each team will plead its case for drafting a certain position. So in other words, you'll have one team that's arguing for the tech, you know, like, oh, we need to draft a tackle here. And then another team is going to argue for the receivers. Another will argue for defensive ends. So you're going to have all these kind of clashing clans, you know, with their uh, position groups going head to head on who you're going to draft at number nine. What do you think of this idea? It sounds like a middle school group project is what it sounds like to me. <laughs> it kind of does. It sounds ridiculous. You're in I'm, charge of magic markers. You're yeah, in like, charge of paint. You get so, the sparkles. You bring God, the blue. <laughs> I, I get that you want to flesh out different ideas. I get it. I totally get it. But I feel like he's like, okay, you guys do all these different things and then just come back to me with a presentation. And then I'll make the final decision. Mm-hmm. I just, I don't like it. It seems very juvenile. It seems like he doesn't want to do the work himself. Um, all of those things is what it feels like to me. And I feel like he's going to be sitting back with like a rubric, like grading out, you know, as they're given the presentation. Oh, okay. Uh, and the highest grade goes to, all right, that's what we're going to do. I, I don't like it. Yeah. And you know, like, what's the, you know, the thing about you know, like too many cooks in the kitchen or whatever it's, you know, like I used to have a boss that told me, you know, like, don't ask for input from other people because you're only going to get a million different answers when you do that. You know, yep. sit back and do the work yourself and make the decision yourself. You can weigh it out all you want, but you know, like how attached to these different position groups are these people really going to be? You know, like right. are they going to get truly dug in on this whole thing? And then you're going to have like, you know, these these big, you know, like fraction. You know, it's going to fracture because you, you know, like you go with the receiver. You know, when the, you know, two thirds of the rest of the guys wanted you to go with, you know, two different other people, you know, are you going to end up, spl- you know, splintering the whole thing? So, Seriously. yeah, I agree. I, I, I think it's um, on the one hand, there, there is at least a little bit of creativity to it. But on the other hand, it just feels like it's a little bit too much. And the guy at the top who's getting paid all the money just needs to take the input, you know, via the normal routes and make a decision with his big boy pants on. Exactly. It just feels like he's feels like he's spreading the blame before the decision is made. That's yeah, that's like. true too. He's got someone he can point the finger at if it goes wrong, right? Yeah. Mm. Decaf wants to know if there's any word on Matty Westbeld yet. There has not been that I have seen. Let me check the uh, the old X-File here real Ooh, quickly. I like that. Just make X-file. sure. Maybe that's what he should have called it. Just X Files instead of. Yeah. X. Love it. <clears throat> she tweeted the other day on Monday, April Fool's Day can't be the right day to announce anything with a uh, laughing emoji. She has not tweeted anything since then. So, Maddie. still no word from Maddie Westbelt on what she's going to do with her future. All right. Fine. I'm trying to yeah. put myself in her shoes. I mean, she'd probably be a pretty high draft pick. But I don't know. That, like the WNBA is so tough. Is you know, it? okay. Because like, okay. even even first round picks in the WNBA don't always make a roster. Oh, wow. You know? I didn't know that. So yeah, like okay. you have to be upper half. And I just I don't know. She's got, Fair I enough. think, 12 days from now to announce what her plans are. I think the draft is is coming up here fairly quickly. Let me let me check here real quick. Do, do, do. It is April fifteenth. Yes. So it's they've got to make their decision here. Yeah, I was going to say it's coming up because they got to at least give teams an opportunity to you know get them on their board and all of those different things. But yeah, yeah. Josh asks, just a fun thought, since the college women's game is becoming so popular and we have so many alumni in the WNBA, what would you guys think about the WNBA having alumni teams? So like Notre Dame team versus the UConn team or whatever. 
Um, I mean, I look, think that man. would be kind of a cool like all star like all star kind of thing. thing. Yeah, yeah. Put like you get enough players from together. different. Yeah, like however many you've got. Maybe even just do it three on three as opposed to like full teams. So you can do like a little. You'd have a lot of guards for Notre Dame. That would be yeah. The that's very true. That's very true. But you, you know, like a little three on three alumni type tournament or something like that. Kind of like they're you know they did they're doing three on three in the Olympics and stuff like that. I know? think that'd be fun. Do it as like an All Star Weekend kind of a thing. Yeah. You know, I'd be I would watch that honestly. I, I I'll say it. I would watch it. I would. I think that would be fun. I, there's a lot of Notre Dame. I mean, gosh, what is there five or six Notre Dame? players in the WNBA right now at least because I know I think three or so made the all-star team last year so I mean yeah that would be a lot of fun I would watch that mm-hmm. TD4ND says West Build would raise her stock by staying and I I agree with that as well because she she worked a lot with the uh new addition to Neil IB staff Carlos Knox this year he was his official title was player development and he had spent the last several years actually in the WNBA, including okay. Indiana Fever, and I, I think her game, you know, a lot of it there. There were some different aspects to it, but I, I think that um, she could really potentially like turn herself. She she would raise her stock. I just I agree with that. I think she could be potential has a chance to turn herself into a high first round draft pick next year, as opposed to probably yeah you know mid to lower this year. And again, just being a first round pick is not a guarantee that you're going to end up making a roster. I think a couple of years ago, like the Indiana fever cut a player that they drafted wow. fairly high in the first round. So. Oof. Yeah. Fill in the blank. The Iowa LSU elite eight women's game setting an all time viewership record with more than 12.3 million viewers is blank was predicted right here on IB Nation Sports Talk because we talked about how it could have been the highest, re- you know, all of that, right? Because uh, I believe the national championship game last year was, what, 10 point something, and this ended up getting mm-hmm. 12 point something? That's awesome. Yep. That is that is awesome. You know, people were watching for all the right reasons because it was great gameplay on both sides, even though I know there's a faction of people, a large faction, that – Wanted to see LSU lose for whatever reasons. I was one of those people for sure. Uh, But, you know, watching Caitlin Clark play was a lot of fun. Um, You know, I I enjoyed the game. I watched the game. The first half was extremely competitive. I thought the coaching was good on both sides. You know, they had to. I was amazed at how Iowa was able to just dominate the second half after the, as close as it was in the first half. Yes. Angel Reese ended up with like 20. I didn't even realize it at the time. She ended up with 20 rebounds in that game. She was all over the place. For a minute there, she was the only one rebounding. It felt like. That's true too. I mean, it was. Yeah. So, and. and, No, but I said it yesterday. It was, you know, it takes a lot for me to be locked in from start to finish in a game. And we've talked about my, you know, thumb you on the are clicker. You are click happy. Yeah. Yes. Yes. I will flip. If you're not, if I'm not engaged, I will yeah. flip. And I don't think we flipped off the game all night, even during commercials. I flipped at you halftime. Know? Kept me I engaged. I might have at halftime just like to see, because I know there was some baseball on. I can't remember exactly. But here's some perspective, though. That game, 12.3 million viewers. Better than the World Series last year. Better than the NBA Finals last year. Better than better viewership than the Orange Bowl, Cotton Bowl, and Peach Bowl this past year. Wow. Better than the Big Ten, Pac-12, and Big 12 championship games. More viewership. That's And I'm talking football, not basketball. Right. And also, $12.3 million for that women's basketball game is better than every 2023 college football game with the exception of Ohio State, Michigan. Wow. Not bad. It's amazing what <laughs> Not happens. Not bad at all. Everybody hates one team. It is. Well, and that's and they want to see you know that Clark drives too, it. But, you like yeah. I said last night, you had you had <clears throat> perceived good versus yeah. evil. You had a hero and a villain. I mean that's oh, yeah. that's what drives drama and TV and, and ratings. 
right? You had somebody to cheer for, you had somebody to cheer against. Absolutely. And there was multiple things to cheer against for LSU. And, you know, then you had Iowa, who was obviously Caitlin Clark, but then they had a bunch of role players and they're just the all shucks. We're just here to win, you know, kind of an attitude, which was great. I mean, it was great. They then the supporting cast for Iowa played really well. And it's the first Iowa game I've watched. And I don't know if that's the norm or not, but I was very impressed. They played very well as a team. Yeah. Antoine's going the racial route. I'll just say like whoa, that had whoa, nothing to do with it whoa. for me. I'm just, I'm speaking, but the Kim Mulkey factor is the bigger thing. Oh, I, I can't That's, stand that woman. And she's yes. as white as they come. To me, it's, it was really, you know, like, um, Flo J Johnson, like great player. Like that's who should have been trying to defend Caitlin Clark. I think most of the night and not the little blonde girl. Right. Who's having trouble. By the way, the I don't like her either. Row. And she's very no. white. So it has <laughs> nothing exactly to do, right. has nothing to do with race whatsoever. It has to do with attitude and uh, the way they come off when they talk. I mean, that's, you know, I didn't like her when she was at Louisville and I don't like Kim Mulkey in any way, shape, or form. So, yeah. <laughs> Paul Mall Smoker Coach says Joe. That's, I mean, kind of sums it up, I think. Salty said the LSU-Iowa Elite Eight game showed us some of the best of Clark and the worst of Reese. What do you expect from Clark and Beckers in the semifinal game? And who wins? I'm really interested to see this because the Paige Beckers I saw – when Notre Dame played at UConn and beat UConn back in January was, yeah, very underwhelming. Yeah. Like, Nana Hidalgo completely outplayed her. And as I talked about with Muffet McGraw, I think that, like within the next day or two when I had Muffet on the show after that UConn game, Gino Ariema had no answers for Hannah Hidalgo that night. And I mean, that's obviously going to be the question. Can he at least put together half an answer for Caitlin Clark? That's going to be the whole thing. I, we're not going to see those two players, I don't think, go head-to-head, one-on-one a lot in that game. You're going to see whoever UConn thinks is its you know, best defender. Yeah. Best defender slash next best defender on Caitlin Clark. <clears throat> and, you know, like you might say, you know, like be interesting to see what Iowa counters with, uh, with Paige Beckers. But – not too many people have had answers for Caitlin Clark as as LSU yeah, I, out the other night. If I'm coaching, I'm just throwing a multitude of players at her, you know, just different styles, different ways, just trying to mess with her as much as I can. You know, you throw a zone, you throw a man to man, you you gotta you gotta match up, you gotta <clears throat> you can't just do one thing. You can't you can't just do one thing and just hope it works. You know what I mean? You you've got to you've got to continue to kind of throw different things at her and and hope that. Something right. sticks for a little while because then she's going to adjust and then you've got to adjust. It's like, it's going to be a chess match. Yeah, David says that's because Sonia did a great job defensively on Beckers. And you're absolutely right. And that's really, you know, like, don't get me wrong. Hidalgo's obviously a great player. And the fact that she's leading the nation in steals shows that. But something that doesn't show up in stats is just being a true lockdown defender. Right. And that, that is the underrated part of Citron because she does typically draw the other team's best offensive player. Obviously, especially, you know, if they're they're a guard or a wing or what she's going to draw the other team's best player defensively. And she's had a lot more success than not. Oh, yes. Yeah. You know, again, that's 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 where she's so underrated, I think, is just what she does at the defensive end of the floor. Stuff, just little stuff that doesn't necessarily show up on a stat sheet. You know, with the exception of holding that player below their average most of the time. Sure. Two notable NCAA tournament snubs, Indiana State and Seton Hall Vince, are in the NIT championship game after semifinal wins last night. Does making it to the NIT title game make up for missing out on March Madness? Does it mean they should have been in March Madness or does it make it up for them? Like, how are you? Where are you? Make it up for point? them because, like, the whole. Okay. Like I think I think it's 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 actually I heard another show and I mean everyone's entitled to to go with the questions that they want you know they ask does this prove that they should have been in well no you make it all the way to the NIT finals I think that there's at least some evidence that you probably deserved 
to be there. But you know, there's there's but always the, same, the question of who are you knocking out if you're letting right. them in. But, uh, yeah, I'm just talking about from okay. Okay. from that team's perspective. Yeah. Does it sort of make up for the okay? We got left out of March Madness, but now we're playing for an NIT championship. Yeah, because you play with a chip on your shoulder. That's how you frame it as a coach. Like, hey, man, we got left out. Let's go win this thing and prove everybody wrong. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, I think it does. Uh, honestly, I <clears throat> the the argument that people are using: oh, they should have been in the NCAA tournament. Look what they're doing in the NIT. Well, if I'm not mistaken, they were the next best team right. that didn't make it in. Well, now they're in the next best tournament. They should win it. That That's my logic. They should win the next best tournament that you're in <laughs> sure. because they were the next best team to get left out. So I, this is expected as far as I'm concerned. If they would have gone and laid an egg in the NIT, then it would have just added fuel to the fire that they didn't belong. Right. And so they're just saying, hey, we're the next best. That you're saying that we're the next best. We're going to go win the next best tournament. And I, I think I, that's fine. I think Seton Hall like played an overtime game in their first round NIT game. And I think <laughs> that's that's where it's tough is those that that first round or two when you're playing right. in sure. you know in in home gyms and <clears throat> the enthusiasm is typically fairly underwhelming. Right. I think I think that at least for like Indiana State especially because there was so much talk about them and, you know, the cream Abdul Jabbar guy and, you know, that whole thing, like this at least gives them some kind of national spotlight now at the end of this thing. Maybe they would have won a game or two. They might've been stuck in a play in game. Who knows what would have happened had they actually made it to the NCAA tournament, but like getting through those first couple rounds is the most difficult part. I think about the NIT because you have to sort of, fake some enthusiasm yeah, for sure. to get through it. But now you're, you know, you're in the semifinals last night. Now you're in the championship game. You got a little bit more juice and, you know, you got a chance to hang a banner in your yeah. gym when it's all said and done. And I guess you could still have hung a banner if you had made it to the NCAA tournament. You know, you just, you know, especially like Indiana state, it's like, you know, cause they haven't been to the tournament very often. They could have hung something up there that said, you know, 2024 NCAA tournament or whatever, but, now they can hang something that either says champion. NIT champion or NIT runner up. When it's yeah. All said and done. Absolutely. I, I, did they get screwed? No, I don't think they got screwed. I don't they didn't have the, they didn't have the resume for it. Yeah. And I would they rather needed, go. They need a little bit better wins along the way. Yeah. They won the games they could, but they needed a couple right. more like actual quality wins to get them in. hundred percent. I, I don't have any sympathy for Indiana state. I'm sorry. And it, it is the consolation, but right? Is the goal to just make it into the NCAA tournament and then get and then lose a you know win a game and then lose in the round of thirty two? Right. Like, is that the goal, right. or do you want right. to go to a tournament and potentially win the whole thing? I, yeah. I don't know. I, well, because like everyone says, oh, we missed out by not being able to see you know cream up build you know like that guy. Turn on and, the NIT and you well, can like, watch look, it. Look, they also could have lost in their first game and then no one was going to talk about exactly. them anyway. Right. The only time you start talking about them is if you do. You know, like what Oakland did and the Gelke right. guy or whatever that, you know, like you actually knock somebody yes. off and you move along. Exactly. By the way, I forgot to mention, I just saw this today. Um, you remember we were talking about when Marquette was here, the women for the NCAA tournament a couple of weeks ago, Megan Duffy, the former Notre Dame point guard, was the Marquette head coach. She is no longer the Marquette head oh. coach. She will now be coaching against Notre Dame on the regular because she's the head coach at Virginia Tech. It was just announced today. Really? Yes. Wow. Virginia Tech head coach Kenny Brooks <laughs> left and uh, is now the head coach at Kentucky. And so Megan Duffy, okay. former Irish point guard, is now the head coach at Virginia wow. Tech. So, wow. Okay. Going to Blacksburg. Interesting first. little development there. It is a very interesting development. So we're going to yeah. see a little bit more of her. Yeah. Awesome. Love it. Yep. So now maybe Bill Scholl up there at Marquette goes fishing for another Notre Dame alum somewhere down the road. Wouldn't you know, surprise so. me. Nope. All right. How does UConn and North Carolina State both getting their men's and women's teams into the final four affect your interest in uh, this weekend's games? Does not affect it in any way, shape, or form. It's a zero <laughs> for me. I I will say it's an impressive feat especially UConn because they kind of have been doing it. Like it's kind of a continuous thing for them. NC state, it's a little bit, you know, more of an aberration, especially since they were an 11 seed uh, on the men's side. 
fun story. Don't get me wrong, but it does not make me want to watch the game anymore. Games plural any more than I would have in the first place. Yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, like, especially like I, I might be a little bit more inclined to watch the Purdue game because NC state is playing, you know, just based on who maybe the matchup would have been sure. Like, I don't know how interested I would have been. I, I probably still would have watched, but my clicker might've been out. In full. <laughs> like if Duke had won that game and it was Purdue Duke, it'd kind of be, eh. yeah. You know, on the men's side, UConn, Alabama. I'm not that thrilled about that. Um, you know, on the women's side, I would have watched the Iowa game no matter who Iowa was playing. So I suppose just the fact that it's UConn at least adds some more interest because you do have sure. you know yeah. a big program like that. NC State, South Carolina does nothing for me. <laughs> on NC the other State's going to get El Smoke showed by South yeah. Carolina, but yeah. you know, I do think you know something <clears throat> that's interesting is. The Notre Dame women beat both of those teams, NC State and UConn, and here they are now in the Final Four, and they actually played South Carolina as well. So Notre Dame actually played three of the four teams that are in the Final Four this there year. There you go. Interesting little connection. Yeah. No How much doubt. that matters, I don't know, but it does show that they played some tough competition, I guess, at least this year. I but but big picture, yeah. I'm like you. I, it really doesn't affect me one way or the other. It's good for them. Hey, awesome. Yeah. You know, that's not an easy feat. But, uh, yeah, it doesn't make me want to watch anymore. Yeah. TD4 and D, cool, but doesn't move the needle. I think that I would yeah, probably. I think that's fair. I mean, it's great for those schools, obviously. <clears throat> and when you like when you look, it, it kind of stinks, actually, that you have Purdue, who hasn't been there since 1980, and NC State, who hasn't been there since 83, playing against each other. You and, know? and the, the uh, matchup of the bigs in that game is going to yeah, be fascinating that's, to watch. It's, it, it, it actually is. Yeah. Like I said, like I'm a little more interested because of the NC State factor in that game, just because of what you just talked about there. Yeah. The Edie, the Edie versus Burns inside. Yeah. And I, yeah. I mean, like I said, I watched NC State when they came to Notre Dame and I watched the Burns kid. And I mean, he won the game for NC State. He hit the last second shot to win the game yeah. against Notre Dame. And I watched him the entire game. And it's just amazing to me that that big of a dude from a wit standpoint, can make it up and down the court as often as he does and play as well as he does. I mean, it's just, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense, <laughs> but he's a good player. Yep. He's a good player. Decaf says he has no interest in the men's tournament. And, you know, let's, let's be honest, you know, as we've talked about on this show, there is a lot more interest. There's an all time record interest in the women's tournament this time around. I think there's a lot more interest. And we'll, I've got a question. That I'm that I'm saving up. I'm putting in the back pocket. Save it. Are you going to be here Friday? I believe I will be. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> Couldn't yes. remember. Well, saving it up for Friday. What? It was a question mark. Well, give me a well. It, I want a there, yes or a no. I will be there. But there okay. was a question because we're going to go on a little, uh, like a 24 hour little trip starting tomorrow. Okay. And but I'll be back by Friday night. Excellent. So excellent. So I'm saving it up for Friday. Yes. In the back. All pocket. right. Love it. If I can remember. What Are we going to be, is it going to be a triumvirate or is it just going to be you and me? I believe it's the three of us. Nice. That I know of. I don't think we've got a whole lot of, I don't think we got a lot of April conflict. I'll have to go back and double check that spreadsheet though. Yes. Got to get to the spreadsheet. I yeah. know there's some track meets in there for me. I was going to say, uh, I don't think I've got any April. You're back, buddy. Basketball's done. You're back and you're not going yeah. anywhere. Just stuck with me every day. <laughs> All right, good questions in the mailbag tonight. Appreciate it as always. We will uh, wrap it up with that. Hit that like button before you leave. And of course, play your podcast. Go to the podcast. Go to Apple. Yeah. Go to Spotify, wherever it happens to be. Hit play on those buttons if you are if you don't catch all the show here on the old YouTube channel. Great to have you, though. And we will talk to you tomorrow on Aviation Sports Talk.